purity, cleanliness and freedom. Then Sadiyo Se Surat. That means throughout its life it has to touch. It has to have the touch of sunlight. Okay. Sunlight, air and soil. When it will have a integration with this tree, then only it will give rise to the biodiversity. Jeev Shristi ko paras purak aur poshak nata jodkar. So that means with all these we call it as panch mahabhuta. So when it connects with all these, it flows free. That is what is allowed. Now just try to visualize. Did you ever see this kind of a river? And if you know that now across the world, there is also a lot of policy developed. Even the supreme courts of many countries have given these rivers a status of living entity. So accreditation is not a one-size-fits-all process. It's geared and it's grounded on what each institution wants to accomplish, the characteristics of each institution, its strengths and weaknesses, uh, and its aspirations. So the standards of the accreditors are not there to impose what an institution does, but they are there to guide the self-assessment process. Um, the second point I want to raise is that accreditation involves a judgment related to the quality and effectiveness of an institution and a program related to its mission. So let's say um, uh, here at Party Day we have, might have a mission that um, has to do with offering uh, opportunities for social mobility to our students through the delivery of education. When an accreditor comes to look at what we're doing, they're going to uh, want to, you know, see some evidence of how we achieve this social mobility. And the third uh, point I want to raise uh, for accreditation is um, that it provides assurance to the public, what we call external stakeholders. Um, that an institution or a program meets or exceeds established public expectations. So it's a very good sign to the outside world of an institution or a department that the institution or the department meets quality criteria. And these three things play an important role, as we're going to see uh, uh, as we progress with the presentation, in the process of how a student tries to select an institution the team comes in from the outside, uh, it's external members, it's professors, higher ed uh, administrators to come in the um, uh, institution to be accredited. And they look at the evidence, as we say, we look, they look at the evidence. And then if that goes well, then the whole process ends up uh, in the accreditor, what we call the commission, which is um, a group of peer faculty and professionals, we actually make the uh, final decision. So you see what we mean by a collegial process, as they said. Uh, a lot of people are involved, but it's not one person uh, dictating what has to be done and how it goes. 
proceeds. Uh, it's a rigorous process. Uh, it goes through a number of steps, and it might take up to um, from three to five years to get a credit, a credit institution and a creditor, a crediting organization that are geared to a credit program. So I'm giving some uh, examples here, you can see those on the screen. Uh, in other parts of the world, the organization of the accreditation system is different. So if you're looking to go outside of the, the US, uh, you might not see this um, structure of the accreditation as it's done here in the United States. Uh, from my experience, mostly from the European front, uh, the government has more of a say, the government agencies have more of a say about giving uh, the approval to programs and the universities to uh, issue degrees. Um, and only recently, uh, this sort of independent and collegial approach to accreditation has entered uh, into the European uh, system. So let's turn our attention to the other part of my presentation, which is uh, international student mobility. And since I was the first uh, person on the list uh, in today's talks, uh, I did I want to just give a rough idea of what we're talking about. And this is based on data uh, and, and the way that uh, US agencies look at international mobility. So they look at two flows, let's say people who come from abroad to the United States uh, and people who um, go from the United States abroad to uh, study. So for the um, uh, incoming um, uh, students, what you, you, we see and, and, and measure are the number of undergrads, uh, the number of graduate students coming in, the number of non-degree students, meaning students who come to do, let's say, uh, English or the foreign language program, and what we call the optional tra uh, uh, practical training, which is a program that an international student can take advantage of if they're studying in the U.S. after they graduate, they can stay for a number of years and work uh, in the U.S. Now, for uh, American students who want to go abroad, Usually we talk about all credit study abroad programs uh, or non-credit experiential activities like uh, internships that you uh, might be doing or even uh, doing distance learning programs with universities that are outside of the US. So here are some of the latest numbers. These are red hot figures that I uh, managed to get from uh, this week's presentation of uh, um, IAE, uh, IIE, sorry, and the Open Doors uh, uh, Research Survey. So, in terms of the incoming flow, we have 2021-2022 academic year will be um, and it has rebounded to about half of the pre-pandemic figures. So before the pandemic, before 2020, we had you know, more than 350,000 um, students going on, every year going on uh, study abroad from the US to uh, international destinations. And we have a few of them that are doing other things like non credit experiential activities, uh, about 12,500, about 16,500 students doing remote, um, uh, you know, remote internships, uh, remote uh, video conferencing, teaching, uh, etc. And this is a you know an increasing uh, number. So the the question is, uh, you know, what do students look for when they're looking? Uh, to study abroad, apart from the cost. I took cost down because, uh, especially for students who want to come to the US, cost is like a, a, a huge factor. But if you take cost out, uh, either for US students going abroad or for students coming from abroad, these are some of the um, things that they're looking for. So, top of the list in, in a few of the number of books, 
study and I looked at is how the accreditation process provides any information to this international student across the United. So this is um, so getting closer to the end, this is I think the most important part because is there a connection? And in this slide I tried to summarize uh, a, a lot of my thinking. So on the left hand side you see a student uh, with all these questions of reputation, of quality, you know, what is this international university about, this international program, what, what is its faculty, uh, will it provide any professional graduates uh, you know, uh, go into after graduate. So all this is wealth of information is very helpful, especially to an international student who tries to decide what is a credible and reputable program to um, uh, to attend. The second is as an accredited school attract top faculty and subject matter experts in the fields that they teach and they offer and the program they offer. So accreditation helps a department or institution be more attractive to faculty uh, who have, uh, have been, you know, uh, a high profile in the subject uh, field, and it's easier to attract um, those faculty. Uh, also, accredited schools often have more extensive exchange relationships, partnerships, world networks, both nationally and internationally. And this is because the accreditation process, uh, especially related to lately, is becoming more internationalized. Accreditors want to see institutions and programs linked to international partners. National also, but also international. So an international student, uh, if they look at an accredited university, probably they will see more uh, of these international links. Um, and um, I think part of the, you know, what, what the effort is today and you know, starting from the Department of Education coming down to our um, uh, Office of International Education here at Harvard uh, um, the whole effort is to expand this link. What do you do when you're there? The second, and maybe it's the, the piece of advice I want to emphasize the most, is to be comfortable, learn to be comfortable in discomfort. Studying abroad can feel like a really exciting, but it's also an intimidating experience. Um, so one of the strongest pieces of advice I could give is to learn to be comfortable with stepping out of your comfort zone, bravely facing the anxiety that comes with new experiences by trying new things, speaking a new language, and meeting new people. And the third piece of advice would be follow your heart. It sounds like a bit of a cliche, uh, but I think it's important to trust your intuition, your sense of curiosity when you're thinking about choosing a study abroad experience. Of course, uh, you want to have an experience that's complementary to your career and your field of study, uh, but also what sparks your interest? What could you learn more about? How could you tap into your motivation to know something more about the world and make study abroad work for you? Um, if you're able to do this, I think it, you know, it, it may be one of the few times in your life when you open yourself up to this fundamentally different experience. And this is something that uh, always will accompany you down life's path for, for the rest of your life. And that's how it's been for me. So, to summarize that, study abroad offers a wide range of experiences. Uh, learn to be comfortable in discomfort and follow your heart or your intuition. And I'll talk a little bit about my experience. Um, in college, for my undergraduate, I majored in both French and Spanish. I had the opportunity to uh, study abroad in France and in Ecuador and in Latin America. I spent a semester in Grenoble, or Grenoble France, in the back of the house, uh, not far from the Swiss border. Um, this was something very organized by the school. Um, I studied with a host family, and I studied in a university with a lot of other students studying abroad. Um, and in spite of it, with a friend circle, uh, it was really challenging in a lot of ways because uh, it was fascinating because I was, you know, became kind of enchanted and in love with Latin American culture, and that really determined kind of my, my subsequent studies, especially popular culture in Ecuador. Uh, there's a variety of things you can do, and depending on where you go and what you study and how that has to do with what you're studying, that can really determine the course of your experience. 
The second most strong piece of advice is learn to be comfortable in discomfort. Learn to step out of your comfort zone. You know, a lot of people can do study abroad, but maybe they only stick with people that are also studying abroad. That is an important support, uh, it's an important support group, but really you need to, to step out and, and that's what's going to be the most enriching experience. I don't think I've met anybody who has said that they had a you know ultimately negative study abroad experience in spite of the challenges. And finally, follow your heart, follow your intuition. If you're able to pursue it, you should keep in mind your own interests, your own passions. Uh, really, how can it uh, how can it contribute something to your career and what you're doing? But beyond that, you know, maybe one of the few times in your life you're able to to do something that's interesting, tap into your interests, your passions, uh, and uh, various a various aspects of who you are. So, thank you for listening. And it quickly became my favorite class because it allowed me to see a glimpse of what it would be like to immerse myself in a culture unlike my own. But it was un it wasn't until studying here that I truly experienced that. It has fundamentally changed the way I perceive the world around me. I never realized how much American culture is actually inspired by that of Italian culture. Just the other day in my Italian cinema class that Dr. Soleri teaches, I learned some of my favorite 1980 slasher films were actually directed and produced, um, inspired by Italian horror films made decades before. I think it's important, it's an important realization that our day-to-day -day lives are impacted heavily by other cultures. Even in the Italian language classes here, I've been encouraged to listen to Italian music. It definitely helped me learn the language, but it also helped give me exposure to a genre I wouldn't have otherwise been exposed to. I actually saw Monaskin, um, an Italian rock band, in concert in September, and that music is like a, a blend of English and Italian language, and they are definitely responsible for um, how passionate I am and inspired by Italian culture. Uh, one of the most significant shifts in my worldview came through the study of Italian history. A couple semesters ago, I was given the opportunity to attend a talk about Italian immigration and discrimination. I otherwise would not have known about the Jewish population in Italy and the discriminatory experiences of people of color who have also immigrated there. These historical lessons have provided me valuable insights into the broader human experience. It's a powerful reminder that our individual cultural experiences are part of a large all part of learning. And beyond the academic realm, my involvement in Italian studies has led to a community of like-minded individuals who share a passion for Italy and its culture. Uh, the bonds formed with fellow students, professors, and the Italian Studies Department have created a supportive network that extends far beyond the confines of the classroom. It's a community that celebrates academic achievements and personal milestones. For me, this is one of them. I'm not a public speaker, but it gives me an opportunity to do that and share my experience. Um, I'm also excited that I have the opportunity to apply for scholarships that are specifically for Italian studies minors, and I hope to use that to study in Florence and expand on my linguistic skills. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dana. I mean, from the perspective of, you know, faculty, hearing uh, this kind of things, gives us purpose, makes us feel good, and uh, this is why we're here, and thank you, really. Um, and mm -hmm. I truly hope that um, you will have a chance to study in Florence, because it's going to be uh, an incredible experience that it is really going to, uh, you know, complement the, the, the uh, Italian studies uh, program here at Farmingdale, and it's going to be, give definitely more meaning to everything you've studied in Italian. Thank you. Our next presenter is Faiza Naim, a student of computer security technology and computer forensics. Um, Faiza, are you in the RAM program? Yes. And she's a RAM scholar. <laughs> and she's a RAM scholar. Um, she is going to, so lots of, uh, uh, about the American education uh, system from an international student perspective. Thank you, Faisal. Thank you for the lovely introduction. 
Um, so I didn't have a presentation, but in the interest of time, I think I'm just going to put it to the side. Um, being born and raised here, primarily I exposed to elementary school. So kindergarten through the sixth grade, I spent my time here in the United States, but I am from a Pakistani household. So growing up, I didn't actually know English the way everybody walking into school knew English. Um, but you know, I spent my primary education learning and growing and then come around seventh grade, which where I um, live was the start of middle school. My family made the decision to move to Pakistan and I attended school there. So um, the days were different. Um, there, there was like the installation of like uniforms and we study to like take the SAT, but over there they study to do A levels and O levels the way that it's done in like the UK. So it was like this little shift in barrier for me. But honestly, like, it was so eye-opening to see, like, the way that the rest of the world educates themselves. I knew how to um, speak the language, but I didn't know how to read or write the language. And so that was sort of one of the biggest turns for me while I was studying um, over there. I spent roughly about eight months there. Um, I think more than even an educational growth, I was exposed to the live culture of the country, which I genuinely didn't even know they had. Um, I was exposed to like the kindness of the people there and exposed to sort of what their mall might look like and the things that they do on their day-to-day -day that make the country so unique. Um, fast forward, I came back, I think, the following year. I wasn't exposed to here in the United States. Extracurriculars um, were mandated in a sense of, I took woodworking, which if you look at me, you would not even be able to tell that I need a jewelry box all by myself. <laughs> but the difference of their day versus the common nine period day that I had was something that I was working on adjusting to. Um, and yeah, so those were sort of my experiences of going um, internationally. And then I'd like to now bring it all back to my time coming back into the United States. So as a student coming into the United States, um, with my international experience, what I can honestly say about it all is it's truly I need to be able to experience education on um, the other side of the world, essentially. The way that you see um, their day-to-day -day happen, the way that their days in classes are structured, and the way that professors or teachers at the time that we call them um, conduct their lectures is very, very unique. I would like to say learn to appreciate the culture. Um, there's a predominance of that country's culture here. And when you come back to the United States, you are able to see sort of the diversity of all sorts of different cultures come together. And lastly, um, I honestly feel like this is about everything all. You get to grow. So every experience you take is a moment of growth. More than anything, these experiences shape me as a person, honestly open my eyes to whatever I look forward to doing as I move forward on to my career. It's made me such a big travel bot um, nerd. I want to see the entire world. <laughs> um, so I'd like to leave you with this. Award-winning journalist Lisa Ling says, the best education I have ever received was through travel. Thank you. Good morning. Um, he was in the big, I think he was in there earlier. Um, we have done a number of study abroad programs. Maybe some issue with the internet or something. College. Um, to um, okay, learn there. Right. So, um, that's too bad that he was not able to hear today. Yeah, it's really a uh, pity that um, Dr. Jetman is not, um, maybe he had uh, technical um, issues. I, I think I saw him. Uh, uh, I, I didn't show up. I didn't think I saw him. Yes. Yeah. So, um, he might join us again. Um, but I. Question for Dr. Campbell. Now you, at one point, you went back and decided to teach in Ecuador. Was was that um, something a, a plan all along, or because of study abroad and just your experiences, you wanted to just give back to your community? But what was behind that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I had thought about uh, maybe I didn't have like a super. Um, I wasn't sure I was going to do it, but I always thought, okay, maybe I'll do, you know, because I know people would get this, like, TEFL certificate, teaching, you know, or a TESOL certificate of 
teaching English as a second language certificate and I teach for a while. So I think my time there really influenced that happening, right? People I met. And um, you know, knowing that I could have that opportunity, shortly I you know went back and, and lived there for a couple of years. Um, so that's always something that you know still people do, and there's plenty of places to do that for a few years. So that's something that students could definitely consider. Hey, Terry, I'll say the country is heavily math and science based, but they make you pick like in while you're in high school, like do you like biology, do you like chemistry, do you like physics? You know, we come into college and we like sort of make their our path. They sort of make you make your path in high school. But I think something that was also interesting was like the um, Pakistan is a Muslim country. So every Friday, like class would be like a short day. So you would get off at like 12. Um, that was like, that was a way in my in the room. But yeah, I think those, those are sort of like my main key experiences. Um, the teachers, I remember um, there was sort of like this like extra level of respect for them. Um, every time a teacher would walk in, you would say good morning. You would stand and say like good morning, sir, good morning, ma'am. Um, I think just thank you for sharing all these experiences. They were great. I want to ask them um, what would make it easier for them uh, to do a study abroad. What would help them um, uh, take the plunge and, and go for a study abroad program? either as a summer program or within the semester, but I would really like to know uh, their uh, opinion on that. Thank you. That is a great question. Um, so please, one of the students, a student in... Uh, in it's so funny, before I got on this meeting, I was thinking, why haven't I applied to the study abroad program? So I went onto the FarmingNow website, and I think that I think that if there were more emails that went out about it, of like how to even apply for a scholarship, because you're kind of like in high school, they hold your hand through that process. But in college, I have no idea where to go, who to speak to. Dana, we don't even have so a study abroad advisor right now to help that. you, honey. So we'll be receiving that essay very shortly. But I, I didn't realize how easy it was. And that shows you are very it, passionate about all this. Well, we actually okay. have representatives in the campus center awesome. right now. Uh, we have students. Yeah, Samaria. Yes, we were telling you. Uh, so Samaria may be there now. Yeah. One thing that I feel like this exchange because I personally had a, you know, I've gotten into languages and I learned a lot to learn, and I think would be a way for students to participate, not only to study abroad, but also to participate in NGOs. Uh, this past summer, I spent uh, a month in Greece working with uh, a refugee camp, and European students have special scholarships that are given by the government and um, for them to participate in this NGO. So I was wondering if the study abroad, the college or the agency, that do they have specific money to give these students? Because uh, the cost, no. you know, no. the, the traveling is not uh, reasonable, it's not accessible, they have to pay their, you know, their expenses. So I was wondering if the, the department itself has anything specific for them. I'll do that from uh, studying abroad. So on our website, we do have a list um, of scholarships. Most of them are from uh, outside organizations, right? Nonprofits, um, governments um, looking for students um, to go to go to their uh, country to um, specifically to teach, let's say. So um, nothing necessarily. That would be money from the college administration. Um, that would designate for us to use for study abroad. Um, right now, we do have a scholarship. Um, that I would is, like to add um, on that perspective. I, I don't know, we're, 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 but um, we're going to run out of time. Specifically, in fact, I'm, um, I think this is going to. Okay. So I'm sorry. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, all the participants, all the attendees. You know, rudeness, disruptions, unrealistic demands, where to draw right. the line. Right. And so this article talks about um, the difficulty 
yeah. students are having. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's talking about here, uh, a student got upset she wasn't allowed to take a makeup exam at a different time, so she complained to the head of the department, the dean, and some advisors that she wasn't being given a fair chance. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this story goes on right. and talks about aggressive demands, inappropriate classroom behaviors, right. um, faculty members who feel pressured to be endlessly flexible. Yeah. I can tell you, my wife lives this as a teacher. Yes, universities, dual diplomas. Mm. Um, and this is where they have a number. Now, I don't know if you're... Halls okay. that surrounded it. And... You'll see now. So dining hall means we have catering also there. Well, that that was that was the old dining hall when there used to be a residence hall here, okay. and a residence hall there. Okay. To the right, you see Dewey Hall. Okay. Dewey's the only one of the original four buildings that still remains. Okay. Um, this side. That that campus center there. Okay, I had I think come on the first day there. And uh, that tree is a, called the Memorial Oak, and it was planted um, after World War I. Which one? In 1918, yeah. that tree. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Um, the buildings to your right yeah. are called Hicks and Cutler, and those are original to the campus from the 1920s. Okay. They're in terrible disrepair, and it's too cost uh, too costly to okay. repair them. This Thompson Hall? And uh, the Thompson's one of the original buildings, one of the earlier buildings too, but those two, Hicks and Cutler, they won't tear them down, but they won't replace them. Okay. Because they're landmark status. Gleason Hall, the large brick building, mm. that's the largest academic building on campus. It has two classrooms that will hold up to 150 people. Mm -hmm. It houses the dental hygiene program, medical lab sciences program, nursing program, mm -hmm. so a number of the health programs. Okay. But those 150 seat classrooms, that's, that's the biggest classroom we have. At Stony Brook, they had okay. the Javits Lecture Hall, and they have probably 10 classrooms that hold 500. Okay. So we're, we're a much smaller institution. Mm -hmm. um, class sizes, you know, when I went to University of Oklahoma for introduction to philosophy, there might have been three or four hundred people in the room. Oh. Here, there might be thirty. Now in every campus, I find the number of students are that way. Coming to the campus is very few. We're busy Monday through Thursday. Okay. And then, uh, not so much on Friday. They, uh, they built this amphitheater last year, so that's a nice new addition to campus. They okay. use that for open house and other various events. We were in Scotland last summer. Okay. And, uh, she's here, and then. Okay. In the dental, dental yes. hygiene so department. Okay. Doing yes. Yes. Okay. So this is a regular check in? Uh, no, no, this would be a special event. Okay. The tabling we do every week. Okay. So we're, we're actively promoting. I was a little bothersome in the presentation when they said maybe you should be more visible. Oh. Jeanette has been visible every okay. week. Okay. Um, this is one of the dining, this is the dining hall, but mm -hmm. this is basically a pay one price. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, that's Bill, he's the assistant dean of the School of Business. Okay. Um, and then on the other side, there's yeah. a, an a la carte where if you wanted a hamburger, if you wanted oh. sushi, if you just wanted one or two items, mm -hmm. you can go there. There's a, there's a job fair going on. Okay. Um, and that's why. Job fair means industries are invited, those who come for placement interviews? Yeah, well, they'll. We'll, we'll keep it. Okay. We have maybe one minute left. Yeah, no. Right. We're a minute late, though. And then we also have food in meeting room B.
enjoying. Okay. It's funny to, to see like who. Okay. Yeah. How are you? Good to see you. We're just we're, we're just exploring. Dr. Yes. Gandhi is yeah. visiting. So. Uh, okay. Hang on. We can have a list of. Okay. Um, so when we talk about successful outcomes okay. for our students, this is where much of it starts, because you you can see from this crowd that our students are highly sought after by by a number. You know, building companies, enterprise, construction. And, uh, are getting all kinds of assistance for the placement and here it is the job fair and this is the strength of farming days here in the job fair they are getting interaction with the different kind of industries and exploring their opportunities Yeah, so please tell again, that's about the job fair which is going on. Who um, the Nexus Center is applied learning, so the Nexus Center is the job placement location for our students. Okay. And uh, it's very encouraging because years ago, we wouldn't have had that large of a crowd. Oh. Um, but the college's reputation hmm. has, uh, has improved. I noticed that, uh, you know, some of the students are coming dressed for success. Okay. So these are the students who are walking in for getting... Happy hunting. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think those are just students who... Yeah. So, um, so this is the northern and easternmost part of the campus. Okay. The facilities, the, the sustainability, the energy people, they're all over in that area, which is where the maintenance yesterday, is. Yesterday we went. So, to the same place, right? Um, no, that's that's off to the side. You can see the the bus. This is where I mentioned the buses come. Yeah. Um, there are. Uh, we'll just on the way back. Okay, this back. Uh, okay. That that, uh, that beam is from the World Trade Center. Okay. And the sculpture mm -hmm. of the rescue dog. Okay. Is also from the World Trade Center. Oh. So you'll see that many of the trees are mm. are labeled. They have small okay. labels that tell you what type mm. of tree. Okay. Mm. So do we have a extension committees? Extension work committees? 
that community engagement committees? Well, they do. They, there are community engagement efforts, yes. Okay. And for that, they get some grace marks or say uh, some benefit of um, uh, participating in such community work? Well, one of the, um, it's become commonplace these days, it's, a, it's called a digital badge. Okay. And if you participate in certain activities, mm -hmm. you get a digital badge. Right. And those digital badges um, can be used to enhance your academic profile. Right. Because we do tell students that they need to be good members of the community. Yeah, that is important. Like otherwise very few they get involved. So this is the horticulture area. Mm -hmm. Horticulture area now we are. Yes. Okay. And we have this this area and then we have um, the greenhouses. Okay. And we can actually um, we can go look. It's uh So who maintains this? Who is there? Uh, well the horticulture students and physical plants. So is there anybody here today? Okay. I don't know. We we could go in but I don't know that there's much to see right now. Okay. Um, but you see the So is this cabbage or yeah. I think this is cabbage, right? Yeah. This is chili. Uh -huh. Well, <laughs> my hometown was half Mexican. Okay. In Colorado. Okay. Because of migrant farm labor. Hmm. Uh, onions, cantaloupe, okay. sugar beets, hmm. watermelon. Right. So many... Um, Who is maintaining this? Can we enter this? Oh, this is close from here. We offer associate and bachelor's degrees. Okay. So, associate programs also we run here, right? Yes, it looks like there's some activity, some activity going on. Okay. So, if you can ask some. Okay, now we go inside. Is this salt? What are they doing with the salt? It's yes. probably for uh, floral yeah. arrangements. Okay, they must be adding. familiar with Mother's Day in yeah. America? No, no, no. In May. Huh? Second Sunday in May is Mother's Day. Okay. So everybody buys gifts okay. for their mothers. Oh. So my wife gets okay. plants okay. because the college has a big plant sale. Oh. <laughs> so you get, yeah. It's a nice way that how the plants are being watered. Just 
in this area, mm. this is hundreds of dollars. Okay. Um, these, these, these plants will probably sell for hundred dollars a piece. Okay. So these uh, plants are sold also? We sell it from here? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what they do with all these plants when they... They may well be in, in waiting for the plant sale. Mm. But this is a good way that even uh, some uh, they, uh, this can be used for uh, generating some funds also. Well, when I worked at Morrisville, uh -huh. the milk and the ice cream served in the dining hall uh -huh. actually came from the college's dairy. Okay. We had a dairy program, and so they manufactured milk and ice cream. So, because... Oh. Someone can come sit. Yes. So, so much bird diversity is there. So many birds variety. Nancy Thompson. This is in the name of Nancy Thompson. It will look very oh. different in the spring. Banana. Hmm. So fishes are not there in the pond? I don't see. No. It's a big area. I hear them, but I don't see them. They come out of Republic. Right oh, down. okay. They're private jets. Okay, so you are showing me today Republic Airport also? Anybody who's... Anybody is going to... So, um, it's a nice one, but then it is, it has to be properly. I don't remember this being here. Hmm. Okay. So horticulture, there is only one faculty or how is it? Only one? Faculty, because uh, these all things to maintain and manage and put students to work. Uh, how is it being done? <laughs> but it's a very beautiful place. It can be managed well, much more well. It's a place where you can come and escape. <laughs> and, um, and while they frown on people having picnics, hmm. when my girls were little, my wife would bring them and we would picnic in the garden. Okay. So, yes. it's been here a long time. So this was created at that time probably. Okay. This way. Beautiful place. Are you a horticulture student? Excuse me. Um, no? No. Okay. Just a quiet place to read. Yes, yes. very nice. 
So I was telling you about the. That's why I wanted to know when if if we are doing composting and all because mm -hmm. that compost will be useful in all these garden then the waste which is coming out of kitchen and everywhere in the campus if a composting is done is it used in this garden? Yeah, let's go this way. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't know what they. This was the. Uh... Nice. So, I think in this also they must have kept some for composting only. caution area. Bottom olive. A few students working but not hmm. not much to see. But there is person in, in, who's in working. May, yeah. In June it'll be much better. Okay. This boy is doing some work. Huh? Two, three are there. Students are there. They are working good. So. Hello. Are you all happy today? Yes, we are. Uh, what are you doing today?
because we were talking about the sustainability projects which is happening here so i was like to asking dr hall that what we do with all our garbage or the waste which is getting created so is it right. being used here or we are doing composting and all we so i saw a lot of composting here, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it's maintained, how often it's flipped and um, aerated. I'm not sure if it's used on grounds. Okay. Um, but we do try and compost as much as we can. Yeah. Okay. We were actually talking earlier about the possibility of setting up drip irrigation throughout okay. the gardens because okay. um, that's very that's important. Right, drip irrigation. For water conservation yeah. yes, and yes, yes. retention and all yeah. that good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. all the important things. honey bee mm, uh, boxes are also put here Which club? The horticulture, horticulture club. Yeah, I'm actually okay. also the, the secretary. Okay. Oh, the secretary of Horti horticulture club. Good, yes. good, good, good. I, I saw that. environmental club uh, that uh, pamphlet also was put up there. So mm -hmm. there's an environmental club also. Yep, an environmental club and the horticulture, horticulture club. club. The okay. environmental club, they have, um, there's a giving garden that they're a part of that they volunteer a lot of hours at. Um, the horticulture, we do more like like plantings like they the, did a terrarium like the, the horticulture that uh, plantations which are done there inside mm -hmm. so that i was just asking dr hall are we are are we selling also that the plants so, who maintains yes. that um a lot of the stuff that's in the greenhouse right now will be for sale come may that's the, the big for sale right i had mentioned to her about mother's day and the fact that my wife always wanted mm -hmm. me to go to the plant sale mm -hmm. but the problem was it was like when i was in the greenhouse just now picking out only a few things it's impossible because there's it's so impossible. much variety mm -hmm. um they did scale the sale down after covid a bit but uh yeah. oh no, I... well they thought they thought that the state was going to be redoing the greenhouses um after the semester so they weren't even going to have this year, well, this coming year, but now they've pushed off the work on the greenhouse, so now we're like, okay, we'll propagate right. everything, get as many plants as we can. So, we so that uh, fund which comes, like when we sale it, what the fund which comes, is it used for just maintenance and operation of this place? For, yeah, it goes back into the horticulture, horticulture department. department. Yep. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. That's what is needed. It has to be self-sustaining. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. Yeah. Thanks for sharing of all this course. information. Yeah. So there is a lot of equipment oh, also here. Maybe they are using it for the agriculture purpose. Are we also having agriculture engineering section? Hmm? Are we also having agriculture engineering section? No. Only under this horticulture we are doing all this. <coughs> is there any land more than this that where organic farming or anything is propagated by horticulture? Uh, in our uh, on the campus? Yeah. No. No, this is this is the. Um, I, I I do think that the horticulture club does some. Um, landscaping on campus. Yeah, campus that's what she was telling. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's, <coughs> as you can imagine, it's somewhat of a challenge. Right. <coughs> to maintain a campus of this size. Right. 
and not only that the season mm-hmm. the way season changing and it's too much cold sometimes so much so many times it's very difficult <coughs> well ideally yeah. those leaves yeah i want those leaves The structure, the white structure, the cupola. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was rebuilt, and it was rebuilt with a donation oh. from, uh, I don't know if it was from Home Depot, from the founder. Whoever it was from was a, was a wealthy person. Okay. And um, wanted to contribute to that. Okay. And uh, the story was that they, on campus, and... Um, it was mentioned that there were other projects on campus that needed funding too and okay. I guess the wealthy donor looked and said are you looking for another <laughs> donation already okay. and the president at the time looked at him Dr. Keen looked at him and said are you offering <laughs> um, so nice um, chicken horses cows that's a chicken coop. Okay, chicken, chicken coop. coop. So now that is closed down. Now that is the small business development center. It's called Campus Commons. But why did he clo- we close down that animal uh, house? We, because we uh, we eliminated all the agriculture. Oh. So. No, there's the president. On his way someplace in a hurry. Mm-hmm. He's vice president, no? Yes, yeah. we met him. I haven't been in that building in a long time. There. But there is, uh, on several state campuses, there's what's called a school, mm. and they do workshops right. on creating a business plan, right. creating a budget. Um, <coughs> so we have? There are incentive programs mm-hmm. in New York for businesses that are owned by women and minorities. Okay. It's called MWBE. Okay. Minority and Women Business Enterprises. Right. And um, my my family mm-hmm. is Native American. Oh, okay. I'm Cherokee. Oh. Only only a little bit. <laughs> okay. But I'm enough that I'm a member of the Cherokee Nation. Although so much of that has changed to yeah. digital and mm. e-books and the like, but yeah. uh, they can get their Farmingdale gear. But almost everything is available. And, uh, yeah. Good. Before okay. they built this campus mm. center, mm. there was really no place for students to gather like this. Okay. And campus so, center, market, etc. And so. On the other side is the pay one price where you basically get the buffet. Okay. All you can eat. Yeah. And here it's a little bit different. Okay. My daughter's favorite is the milkshake station. <laughs> okay. Mm. Um, mm. Like various bowls and the like. Yeah. Um, chicken burgers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Faculty and staff. Okay. Who are here? Okay. So, like everybody can mix here, have a proper community for them. Uh, uh, they can during the during the day. Typically yeah. From ten to let's say three. Okay. It's it's as busy as that. Or. Ram. Yeah. Because we, we are the Rams. That is our okay. Master. Okay. So. Yeah. Hmm. Those are used for um, youth 
uh, soccer, okay. uh, lacrosse. Okay. They come in. So and that then, backside is the soccer. That, that's the end of the campus. Those trees right. on the back. Yeah, yeah. They, but the the property actually extends, as I mentioned. Beth takes park is back there. Okay. So, I've never seen the edge of the campus in 21 years. I've never been there. <laughs> okay. Um, but doesn't have to pay for it. And it's a nice house. I've been there maybe once, mm -hmm. twice. Okay. I don't I don't get invited much. <laughs> so this uh, Quintine, Quintine Hall, Quintine Hall. is, um, this used to be the physical plant many years ago. Hmm. It was a building that fell into terrible disrepair. Hmm. And I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, they totally refurbished it. Okay. It now houses uh, student activities. Okay. We'll, we'll travel through here briefly because um, this is one of the newer hmm. buildings on campus. Okay. Um, oh, so then you know. Uh, okay. We have a number of uh, small meeting rooms. Okay. Uh, the campus radio station. Mm -hmm. I was about to send it to you. Okay. You can see the students with the yeah. pool table, foosball table. So uh, indoor games, all kinds of indoor so they games can are there. Um, yeah. Underneath us, in this uh -huh. portion of the first floor, okay. is an e-sports. Okay. You know, what does it mean, e-sports? E-sports e e is gaming. Yeah, okay. Because gaming okay. now is, gaming. is yeah, business, right, right, a professional right. game. Right, right. see a lot of students engaged with yeah. other students. Yeah. Right. Dolores Quintine hmm. was actually a, a civil rights advocate. Okay. And um, they renamed the building hmm. for her. Surprise. Yeah, well. <laughs> um. Here. Okay. They don't do, they, they don't do dentistry. Okay. But they do dental hygiene. Okay. And uh, it's one of the only. There aren't that many dental hygiene programs. Okay. Hi. Hello. How are you? And, um, okay. These are um, these little labs. Okay, they then... recently redid mm. the lab, so they're all state of the art okay. equipment. Mm. Okay. And um, the only. So, how much is the course uh, uh, fees for uh, this? Not, 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 ext not extravagant. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you want to do dental hygiene on Long Island, mm. we are it. Oh, okay. The nursing labs are upstairs. So this is one of the classrooms I mentioned that holds up to 150. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. is, is some of the oldest on the campus. Okay. So these, uh, what is this one you just said about no, no, that? No, that, that was that was a different tree. That was the memorial home. Mm -hmm. This one's just a just a big tree. Also, uh, a Macintosh lab okay. because the visual communication uses Macintosh okay. as opposed to okay. PCs. Oh. So there are a number of mm. these labs. Okay. It's um it's a little bit different program. I 
I think it's still a Bachelor of Technology mm -hmm. as opposed to a Bachelor of Science. Okay. So instead of being 50-50 split between technical and general education, okay. it's more like 40-60% with technical mm -hmm. being more. Let me see some, uh, some drawing, work. yeah. yeah. This building is named as? It's yeah, so all student, uh, student work. And then to the right, you'll see the gallery. OK. So this is an art gallery. This is an art gallery. And mm -hmm. um, students sometimes present their work. In this case, okay. it'll tell us. They cannot get a license okay. in New York State from the state. Um, oh, here there is a frog dissection going on. In India, it is not allowed. Animal dissection is totally stopped. Now, see, she is doing the dissection of frogs. Yeah. And that is how I am from biology. Oh, so they are learning dissection. What they are doing, actually, I think. Oh, they are looking at the video, and in that, they are trying to do. OK, dissection. In India, totally any kind of animal dissection is banned. <laughs> well, you have a lot of frogs because a lot of water bodies and... My frog dissection was my message that I was not going to be a scientist. <laughs> I did a lot of I took frog chemistry dissection. and physics in high school uh, because I knew that hmm. I needed a college preparatory program. But okay. No. So the teacher is dissecting and that is uh, shown on that uh, screen and... Students are doing the, the section. See, there is one, it's dorsal side. Here it is ventral side. He's trying to open up. Wow. I'm not sure that everybody would be as excited about that as you are. <laughs> I am very excited. And to reconstruct the skeleton. Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> so, um, once upon a time, yeah. it would be unheard of for a Farmingdale student to go on to medical school. Okay. Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah, so when you ask about who arranges the job fair, hmm. Nexus Center. Okay. So they are still closing up over there for today. Um, but they are. Jeanette, um, okay. went through the process. That was the process. Okay. They had a course. Um, Okay. I, I was so mistaken. I thought that in the virtual world that yeah. they do. Um, see, here's a PHPA on occupational therapy. Mm. Well, that's kind of a clever idea. Get everybody to donate. Another PHPA. What is this? On Monday, probably they are giving information?
third floor there's a tutoring center okay. and a writing center. Honors program? Um, we, we struggled for a long time mm -hmm. to actually have an honors program. Okay. And, um, Research experiences, conference attendance, peer mentoring. So, and it's just 20 accepted students per year. Okay. So it is a, uh, it is, and then, then there are requirements. You must attend a large, earn activity point. There. So that this building it looks like the spaceship. Oh. Right there. <laughs> Doing that. Yeah. To the handicap sign up ahead by the building. Okay. That's that's how far. So every country's a flag every, is there, that's you the, said. Our graduates. Okay. So as many country students are in our campus, that many flags are there. Yep. And it, well. Okay. Th those who have graduated over the years. Okay. So if we have a student from a new country, they're going to have to put up a new pole. New pole. But there's okay. room. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there is a. Here, so much of places there still. 